Now, if you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to turn up this morning to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 23, and verse number 5. Jeremiah, chapter number 23, and verse number 5. Jeremiah 23, 5, the infallible text says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely, and this is his name whereby he shall be called. The Lord, our righteousness. Amen. Father, bless this holy book now as it goes forth in your name, in your name alone. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. We'll title the message this morning, When God Reveals God. The Bible tells us in the book of Jeremiah chapter number 23 that we have a branch. This is unto David a righteous branch. Now, I'm sure you've heard that mentioned many times before, the, uh, the idea of the branch in the Old Testament. It's a very instructive thing, for there are definitely four different perspectives on the branch as you find it recorded in Scripture. For example, here in Jeremiah, it's called the righteous branch. In the book of Zechariah, chapter number 3, and verse number 8, it says, And Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee. For there are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. Note carefully, he's called the servant. And here he is, the branch. These are prophetic statements looking into the future and the application of them. You'll find it in the New Testament. In chapter number 6 of the book of Zechariah and verse number 12, it says this. And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. The emphasis here, the direct, to direct your attention to him being the man whose name is the branch. Then we find in Isaiah chapter number 4 and verse number 2 another reference to the branch. And here's what it says. In that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. Now I'm simply moving across what it says, but what you have here is four distinct perspectives on the branch. One, he's called the righteous branch in Jeremiah 23. Then he's called the servant branch in Zechariah 3. Then he's called the man who is the branch in Zechariah 6, and then finally in the book of Isaiah 4, he's called the branch of the Lord, showing you that it is the Lord's branch reaching high into the very presence and deity of Almighty God. The branch can be found in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's four of them. And this is a great helpful thing in studying the Bible because there are methods in studying Scripture that will help you greatly. A lot of people say, and a preacher, you know, the Bible's boring. How do I understand it? What, how do I put this together? Well, you're not reading a book of history like you'd find in a classroom where you have a chronological progression of things that happened. It took almost 2,000 years to write the Bible, and it is the inspired Word of God. It has a purpose for every age. It speaks to every people on the face of this earth who may pick it up and read it. And so here we are in 2023. Is there anything in the Bible for us today? Yes, there is. You better believe it. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, four Gospels, not five, not three, not ten, but four. And the reason for four Gospels is because they correspond to the four perspectives of the branch. Each one of them deal with a certain part that has to do with that. For example, the Gospel of Matthew is the Gospel of the Kingdom. The kingdom of heaven mentioned time and time and time again in the gospel of Matthew. 
We don't preach the gospel of the kingdom of heaven today because the king was offered and they rejected the king, thereby rejecting the kingdom. So the gospel in Matthew corresponds to the righteous branch, the righteous one who comes in the name of the Lord to take what is rightfully his, but he's rejected. And they took him and they nailed him on a cross. The gospel of Mark is the gospel of the servant. Matthew, for example, has a genealogy that traces the royal line or the legal line all the way back to David. And he's called the son of David. But in Mark, he's called the servant. Isaiah chapter number 42 and verse 1 talks about him being the servant of the Lord. A servant has no genealogy. He's simply someone that gets done what he's commissioned to do. And that's what the gospel of Matthew is about, or Mark is about. And this is what we find in Zechariah chapter number 3. He's the servant branch. And so this is now I'm moving. Each one of these you could spend a great deal of time in. But the message this morning is simply using this as part of what we're talking about. For example, the third gospel is the gospel of Luke, Luke the physician. Luke is quite remarkable in that sense because Luke gives a genealogy that traces Christ all the way back to Adam. It deals with his manhood. Behold the man, it says in the book of Zechariah, that is the branch of the Lord. And so we have his manhood recorded for us, his birth, his ministry, death, resurrection, ascension of our Lord Jesus. It is said that the book of Acts and the book of, of Luke written by the same man, comprises 27.5% of the New Testament. That's a lot. Leave to the Apostle Paul to write half of it. That doesn't leave much, does it? So we have Luke writing a great deal about the manhood, the Son of Man of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the priesthood of the church. No, I'm way off. One God and one mediator between God and men, the pastor of the assembly, the Sunday school teacher, the deacon board, the Sanhedrin. So there's one God and one mediator between God and men, Christ the Lord. Be careful. It doesn't say that either. It says the man, Christ Jesus, who is Christ the Lord. But it's emphasizing his manhood. In plainer words, there is a man between you and God. And that man is the Lord Jesus Christ. Then there's the branch of the Lord that we read about in Isaiah chapter number 4. The branch of the Lord. Note carefully. The branch who comes forth from the Lord. The Lord's branch in this earth. If you have a Bible in John chapter number 1 and verse 1, it says in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. The Lord Jesus Christ is the light that lighteth every man that cometh into this world. The Bible says, the word became flesh, and the word was God. The word is a manifestation of the wisdom of God that you read about in the book of Proverbs. But here's what's important. In John chapter number 8 and verse number 58, he says this to these Pharisees that are grilling him and calling him illegitimate and saying that he's demon-possessed and saying that what he does, he does by the power of Satan. And now in their Talmud, they teach that he's in hell and that he's, bo he's bo boiling in oil and burning and that he's the son of Ben Pantera, the son of a Roman soldier and all kinds of things that they say of him. But here in John chapter number 8, John the Apostle, this is the servant of the, this is the, this is the branch of the Lord. Listen to what he says. In John chapter number 8 and verse 58, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. You say that you are children of Abraham. You say that you keep the law of Moses. You, you therefore give your identity to Abraham and to Moses. Well, let me tell you something about Abraham. Before he ever existed, I had always existed. Amen. Let's go back to the book of Exodus chapter number 3 and verse 14. And we'll get an idea of what he means when he says that. In Exodus chapter number 3 and verse number 14, our Lord Jesus Christ quotes this scripture. 
and applies it to himself. It's a great study of the Bible to see how that New Testament writers quote, quote Old Testament scriptures and make applications. That in itself is a great study. But look at verse number 14 of Exodus chapter number 3. And God said unto Moses, when have, Moses had asked him what his name, what shall I tell them? What shall I say to these who sent me? And he said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent thee. These are four Hebrew letters, Aleph, He, Yod, and He. To pronounce them, you must rely upon the Masoretes because they put their vowel points in there. Therefore, we must rely upon Jews. These are consonants. There's no way to pronounce a consonant without a vowel. But it doesn't stop there. Yod, or I mean Aleph, He, Yod, He, can be pronounced Eh, Ho, Ha, Ya, Ha, Wa, Ha. We don't know how to pronounce it. Did you get that? And we don't know what it means. Did you get that? That's what's important. You can get a dictionary. You can get, you can get lexicons. You can get commentaries and go through them. You can do a lot of research in them. Here's the bottom line of this is pretty well accepted by most who study this, and it means this. It means that he is the eternal, present, existing one. In plainer words, he exists because he exists, and he is always existing in the present tense. It is not that he has ever existed. It is not that he ever will exist. He always exists. But now think on it for a moment. When Satan took the Lord Jesus Christ, showed him all the kingdoms of the world a moment of time, and says, this has been given to me, what did that mean? Did that mean that he showed him all the kingdoms of the world that existed at that time? Or did it mean that he showed him all the kingdoms of the world that not only existed at that time, but into the future? In the book of Revelation, it says, the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. When? When he comes back. He will come again and he will take that which rightfully belongs to him. When heaven opens, the Bible says, I saw heaven open, behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he that judge and make war. His name is called the word of God. He is holy, holy, holy. He is king of kings and he's lord of lords. A king must have a kingdom. And believe me, he has a kingdom. Now let's go back to this word in Exodus. What I think, if you look at this and do some thinking into it, it might blow your mind. But think about what I'm about to say to you. That there is never a point in the past that he still does not exist. There is never a point in the present that he still does not exist. And there is never a point in the future that he does not exist. In plainer words, he exists past, present, future, forever, eternal, an absolute, almighty, eternal being that cannot be judged by time, space, or anything of that nature. From everlasting to everlasting, it says, thou art God. Now that's my God. That's my God. That's my God. And when he gave to Satan, he gave Satan something, my friend, that is beyond human ability. It is very possible that the kingdoms that Satan showed Christ there in that wilderness were kingdoms that are existing right now on this earth, 2023. Amen. It's very possible, therefore, that Satan took him into the future and showed him what the future held. In the book of Revelation, the Bible says, John said, I saw heaven open. And when he saw heaven opened, he was in the Lord, he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And what happened to John was not God telling John. What was going to happen? Read it very carefully in the book of Revelation. And John said, and I saw, and I saw, and I saw, and I saw, and I saw. In plainer words, the apostle John was caught into the future. And he was able to look down on this earth and observe what was taking place. How could that be? The apostle Paul said, I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body or out of the body. But he was caught up into the third heaven. He was caught up to a place that you can't find. He was caught up to a place that's not on a map. He was caught up to a place that you can't, since you can't find it, you can't enter into it. Why? It's the third heaven. And that is the abode of God for our purposes, for us. God needs no abode. 
He is forever without an abode. He exists forever because he exists. He is almighty God. Oh, that I would that we get a hold of that today. Because 2,000 years ago when the Lord Jesus was here, he said to these people before Abraham was, I am, I am, I am the ever existing one with no beginning and no ending. Hallelujah to God. So my friend, if you don't believe in the deity of Christ, throw John 8, 58 out. There's no way in the world that you can be believe in the deity of Christ and not believe that he's eternal. The God man's the one that started in Bethlehem of Judea 2,000 years ago. But the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, came down from heaven and God merged himself with human flesh. And that's when the God man started 2,000 years ago. So it's the branch of the Lord and the Lord Jesus Christ is the branch of the Lord. Each of these represent a view the Holy Spirit wants you to see of the identity of Christ. I believe in Christ-centric. I believe Christ is the center. I believe Christ is the object. I believe Christ is the subject. I believe the Lord Jesus Christ, everything that exists or ever will exist or ever has existed, will have its identity as it relates to who Jesus Christ is. In other words, I'm a son of God because I've been born again. That's my relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. This thing's a piece of wood. He made it. That's its relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you following me? The Lord Jesus Christ, therefore, is the judge. He's the standard. He is it of everything. And he's coming again. There are four gospels. One the king, one the servant, one the man, and one God. The Davidic kingdom is in view. Israel has had one David and only one. Israel never had a better king than David. They never had had a better king than David. David was the greatest king that ever Israel ever had. He was the only one who could unite the country and he defeated every foe about him. Israel became rich under the reign of David. David was the sweet psalmist of Israel. He was a singer. He was a poet. He was a writer. He was a warrior. He wrote scripture. David was, my friend, unmatched by anything that had ever lived. Solomon, his son, came and enjoyed the benefits of his father David. But he in no way could even pick up his shoe straps and carry him off the floor. David was head and shoulders above anything that Solomon could have ever been in his whole lifetime. This is why the Lord said through Nathan, I will establish your kingdom forever to David. Not Solomon's kingdom, David's kingdom. And God said to David, I will give unto you the sure mercies of David. It was the Davidic kingdom, therefore, that the Lord Jesus Christ was going to do something with. Look at Isaiah chapter number 11. Isaiah chapter number 11 and verse number 1. Look carefully at this. Isaiah chapter number 11 and verse number 1. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Note carefully. We talked about the branch, did we not? We talked about the four gospels that related to the branch. And look at the context of this now. This is important. The 11th chapter of the book of Isaiah has to do with the millennium. It talks about things that are going to happen that never have happened. And it talks of it in the sense that, look at verse 8. The sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. A time of peace and joy and all of that. It's coming. But look how it's going to come. It's got to come through the Davidic kingdom, through the kingdom of David, through the resurrection of something. Now look at the text in verse 1. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem. Look up that word stem. That means stump. That means something that's been cut down. In plainer words, it is a place of rotting. It is something that has degenerated to where it is no more. Did you know that Israel's last four kings were some of the sorriest garbage that ever lived on this earth? Do you realize that the la- that third king, the third of the four last kings of Israel, his name was Jeconiah. He was so bad that God took his name, Jehovah, off of the front of that and called him Coniah. He was no longer Jehoconiah. He was just Coniah. And the last king, Zedekiah, of the children of Israel, they killed his sons before his very eyes. Ba- ba- Babylonians did to let him know that the Davidic kingdom was finished. I'm going to do away with the Davidic kingdom. It's over. It's done with. And they killed his sons and gouged his eyes out. So he spent the rest of his life thinking about nothing but the fact that his sons had died before his eyes 
and the kingdom was over and it was finished. But Isaiah has something to say about that. Yes, he does. He's got something to say about that. In chapter number 11 and verse number 1, he says, I will bring forth a rod out of the stem, out of the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow of his roots. Only God can raise up that which cannot be raised up. Only God can open a door that cannot be opened. Only God can give hope where there is no hope. Only God can reach above and beyond all that you could even ask or think. Our problem is today that we bring him down to us. We preach a, we preach a human God. We, we make him like us. He's not like us. We no longer know him after the flesh. The Lord Jesus Christ is ascended to the right hand of the Father with all power. He said, the Father hath given me all power. Amen. And when he arose from the dead, he rose from the dead and never to die again. And at the right hand of the Father, he pleads the case of every last one of us. Now, what you believe and what you receive into your heart determines what you are. Words are powerful things. Why do you think witches meet out here in the woods and they gather around and say incantations? Why do you think they're calling forth evil spirits? Why do you think this stuff is coming down upon you right now? It didn't just happen. They're calling for it. They're asking for it. They're asking for the demons that you see moving about in your culture right now. And so it is, Lord God, I come to this altar this morning and I ask you to fill me with the Holy Ghost. Amen. 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 Ask him to fill you with the Holy Spirit. And those words have power if you believe that God's able to do what he said he would. So you have the king, the servant, the man, and God. A king is coming. Yes, he is. He's coming. This is, this is, this is one of the most untenable times that I've known in my life. We're on the precipice of war on every hand. It could, it could explode at any moment. France is burning right now. Have you kept up with what's going on over there? I mean, all you got to do is do a little reading back in the French Revolution, find out what they did then. They took the people in the French Revolution who started chopping off heads, they wound up chopping their head off. That's what happened. We're in a time unknown before. The four Gospels represent the spirit world by four cherubims. What is a cherubim? A cherubim is a spirit being that is unlike anything else. It's not an angel. It's angelic in a generic sense, yes. But a cherubim is a creature that was created for a specific purpose. purpose. Yes, it was. They are near to that which is holy. For example, a cherubim was put at the tree of life with a flaming sword to keep the way. A cherubim is in the holy of holies, overseeing the mercy seat. Yeah. Cherubim uh, were the ones carrying the throne of God in the book of Ezekiel the sovereignty of the Lord was put into their hands to move about and then the very throne of God in the book of Revelation if you'll read over there you'll find out in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 7 before the Lamb of God opens up the books and begins to send judgment upon the earth you have a lion an ox a man and an eagle these are the faces of cherubim we read about them in Ezekiel 1 and Ezekiel 10 they're spirit beings there was one cherubim he was the fifth cherubim, and the Bible talks about him in Ezekiel 28. He was the one who was above the other cherubim. The Bible says he's the cherub that covereth. Who is this? This is Satan. This is Satan. I hope that you've progressed past the point of Satan with a pitchfork and horns. That's for the comic strips. He transforms himself into an angel of light and his ministers into ministers of righteousness. Our churches today are very religious, very, very religious. Get on Google and Google the term affirming church. Just, just do it. Affirming, affirm. In plan of the word affirm, you know what it means. An affirming, I agree, I embrace. An affirming church and find out what they agree with and what they're embracing. And you'll get an idea of what's going on in the country. Opening of the Lamb will open it. A creature comes up out of the sea. Did you know, my dear friend, that 70% of this earth is covered by water? Did you know that 85 to 90, depending on the source you're reading, 85, 90% of this ocean is unexplored? Do you realize that there's a point in the ocean that is 35,814 feet deep? It's called the Marianas Trench. It's the deepest place on earth. Did you realize that that trench is deeper 
that Mount Everest is high. Everest is 29,000, 29 feet or so, somewhere in there. You're looking at 35,000 feet deep into the Marianas Trench. And you're looking at 85 to 90% of the ocean that has never been explored. Does that not yield the fact that there may be something down there that is sinister, wicked, that may be coming up? Do you realize it says in the book of Revelation, he saw this creature rise up out of the sea? The sea is covering stuff, my dear friends, that we don't even know what's in there. Do you know that? Did you know that under Antarctica right now, this is a fact, you can check it out, are tropical plants miles deep under an ice cap in Antarctica? The earth is tilted 23 and a half degrees on its axis. It is because of that 23 and a half degree tilt that we have the seasons. That's all. If you didn't have that, you wouldn't have the seasons. It's 24,000 and about 900 miles around the earth. There are about 24 time zones around the earth. Depend on who you're dealing with, where you are. About 1,000 miles separates each one. If you could fly 1,000 miles an hour, you could take off in New York City and have the sun set in, your windshield, in the windshield of your plane, and it would forever stay there as you went around the earth. The sun would be constantly setting if you could keep up with the speed of the sun. We live in a marvelous thing. It's quite remarkable. Something's coming up out of this water. Something's coming up. Something's coming up. The Bible says the fountains of the deep were broken open in the book of Revelation. What is that? We don't know what lies out there, but we do know this. We do know that the gates of hell have already opened. When a 60-year-old man, naked, marches through the streets of one of our cities in the United States of America, naked, and his male genitalia is standing before little children, little girls and little boys, and he stands there and twerks, and, and I didn't know what that word meant until just a few months ago, twerks, and if you don't know what it means, go home and look it up. <coughs> they didn't use that term when I was a kid, but anyway, in front of these children, and those little children are standing there, and they're shocked at what they see, and yet they're stupid mothers, Amen. stupid mothers, Amen. stupid, Amen. stupid mothers think it's funny. Because their little children are being traumatized by seeing something like that. But it goes further than that. What kind of man, what kind of man will walk like that in front of little children? People are going to live the way they're going to live. We can't do anything about it. I'm not going to change that. I'm not involved in that. I'm going to preach the gospel to them and let them be saved. All right? We all understand that. Okay, we all understand that. This has nothing to do with homophobia or with taking someone's rights away from them. This has to do with imposing perversion in the face of a child. Amen. Where'd it come from? There was a time that this did not happen. We've always had sodomy and that's not what I'm talking about. There was a time when you would not dare walk down the streets of America naked like that in front of children. Something has been let loose. There's a spirit let loose. On this earth. Let me warn you. Please listen to me. Let me warn you. Something is coming that we have never seen before. He that letteth will let to be taken out of the way. I believe God being a gracious, merciful, long-suffering God. Is giving us warning after warning after warning after warning. And preparing us. He's saying, look at this. Can you accept that? Don't you, don't you find a problem with this? He's warning us. You better take your children and you better, you better protect them. You'd better watch over them. They do not belong to the public school system. They do not belong to Caesar. They don't belong to you. They belong to the Lord. And he's given them to you to raise. And that means that when he does that, he'll give you everything you need to raise your babies. And the first thing he'll give you to raise your babies is love for them. Amen. Did you know a woman went on vacation just the other day? A year and a half. I think the baby was a year and a half old. 
left it in its crib, and she was gone on vacation for 10 days. 10 days, 10 days, and this little precious little girl starved to death, whatever, and was dead when she got back. I, I don't think for a minute she thought it would be alive. Do you? 10 days, a little baby, no, you know, I mean, it's, you don't have to get into detail what, what it looked like. And now, of course, they're charging her, and they should charge her. Amen. What caused? Where did this come from? The gates of hell have opened. Christian, you better put on the armor of God. Amen. You better get ready. Amen, I'm telling you again. I don't, I, I, you know, I'm, tr I'm not trying to be dramatic. I just want to tell you. It's not over. You're just seeing the beginning of it. It's going to get worse than you think. And you're going to see it come. And what do I say? I say roll back those heavens. We've already seen the gates of hell open. Now it's time for heaven to roll back. <laughs> and it's time for him to come and receive us into himself. That where he is, there we may be also. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. Amen. If you don't want to see the Lord Jesus come, get rid of me, because that's what I'm going to preach Amen. until he comes. That's what I'm here for. That's what I'm breathing for. That's why I, that's what I, that's why I exist. I exist for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you ready for that? Yes. Is there anybody in this house this morning has any doubt in my mind that there is something wicked out there that is going after your children? Yes. Your children? Yes. Your children? We're queer. We're here. And what they say? We're coming for your children. Yeah. Why don't I close with this? And the reason I'm going to say it like this is because I just, I just want you to think. Uh, Fox News. How many ever heard of Fox News? Fox News has some good people on there. I believe some of those people are, are genuine as they can be, along with Newsmax and the other stations and so forth. This, that, this, that, this, that. But here's the point. Fox News is making a clear distinction between old homosexuality the old homosexual movement, you know, to be accepted and freedom and so forth, and the new radical left-wing transgender coming after your children movement. How many have heard that? How many have seen? How many follow what I'm saying? Okay. So what's the point? The point is this. If you want to get news from Fox News, if you want to get news from Newsmax and all the rest of them, fine. But you don't get your morality and your teaching and your scripture and your faith and what you believe from any TV. It comes from the church of the living God. Amen. Let the book be the arbiter of what you believe. Amen. This book right here, stick with The only way I'm going to be able to do it, stick with the book. I can't do it any other way. I've got to stick with the book or I'll get lost. Sure as the world, I get lost. I can't, I, can't, I can't do it, and I don't know about you. How you do it, I don't know, but I can't do it. I've got to stay in the book. Father, bless your word, especially parents in here, Lord, parents with little children, precious little children. Lord have mercy. The most vulnerable among us, little children. Oh, Father, I pray they have love for them. I pray the mothers will pray to you every day and say, Lord, make me a better mother. Teach me what it means to be a mother. I pray the fathers pray every day to you and say, Lord, show me what it means to be a father. Give me the love of a father for my family and where my place is. What am I supposed to be? What am I in this family? I'm a father. Mother says, what am I in this family? I'm a mother. The little children, Lord, you made them in a special way where they, they know when somebody loves them. They know when somebody cares. They know that. They sense that. You gave them that. That's for their protection. And, Father, I pray now, Lord, that they take what's been said this morning and they realize this is not starting. It's already started. We're already into it. I pray that you'd help them understand that. I pray in Jesus' name. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. And your heads are bowed. Nobody looking. Anybody raise a hand this morning and say, Preacher Lawson, won't you pray for me? Because I understand and I. I